Dr. Stewart is a 50-year expert on stuff, a certified <laughs> member of the Appraisers Association of America. She has spent a lifetime in the world of personal belongings. As a kid in Illinois, she ran farm auction sales. As a young woman in San Francisco, she traded art and antiques. And as a single mom, she sold huge estates from her warehouse in San this? Diego. Yeah. A Santa Barbara businesswoman and scholar, Elizabeth's doctoral, doctoral dissertation, <coughs> The Material <coughs> Image, How Collectors Collect, focuses on the psychology of connoisseurs, hoarders, and those who entertain an object fetish. A 30-year career appraiser, she has taught clients and organizations how to create collections, how to find value and provenance, how and what to leave their heirs, and how to donate. Today's presentation, Savvy Downsizing of Art and Antiques, a Certified Appraiser's Five Piles Theory, and What Not to Give Your Kids, shares the secrets of a seasoned appraiser who has a married millennial son who would rather not inherit. <laughs> Well, hi, everybody, and this is such a thrill to be here at UCSB, and I thank you so much for coming. And um, first of all, I want you all to think of one word, and then I'm going to ask you to shout it out to me. Is there one thing in your house that your kids or your grandkids don't want? Now, think of that word. I'm going to give you the clue. I'm going to give you the cue, and then we're all going to say... Not, well, we could all say China at once because that's a big one. <laughs> but I'm interested to know. I'm going to listen and see. Okay, one, two, three. Wow. Silver. Silver. Ooh, okay. All of these that I heard are on my list. All of these that are on my list. So I premised this talk by saying that your kids and your grandkids think of your house as a minefield. <laughs> And I'm here to discuss why that is and what to do with some of the things that you are thinking that you might like your kids and your grandkids to inherit. Um, does anyone know the author, uh, Alan Watts? Alan Watts. Okay. Alan Watts said, a universe of objects is objectionable. <laughs> and I, yeah, I, I guess sometimes it is. And in some cases, you know, we'll talk about why. Um, my premise in this talk is one succinct sentence, which is value is general, generationally relative to the speed and changeability of life in the 21st century. Does that make sense? So it's generationally relative to the speed and the change of life, especially in the technological universe. Um, at the end of the talk, I want you to leave thinking to yourself, does it matter? And as um, Deborah was telling you in the introduction, I'm a scholar of material culture. And material culture is the stuff of life. And the interesting thing is, is the material stuff of life, does it really matter in the long run? And that's something that we'll talk about a little bit as we go forward. The talk is four sections. And the first section is the top 10 objects, the market, and your grown children and grandchildren do not want. So we're going to talk about the top 10 things that it's been a wide poll of many of my clients over the years who have between 20 and 50 year old heirs, what they don't want. The most objectionable objects, if you can say it that way. And in that group, so I'll give you a little preview. In that group, we're going to talk about the following. We're going to talk about books, but because are you laughing already? <laughs> we'll talk about books. And the thing is, what I know from talking with Deborah a little bit about this crowd, which is this crowd knows books. And so we're going to talk about books more than I generally do. Uh, and, and we're going to put that a little towards the end of the talk. But one of the top 10 objects that your heirs are going to have trouble with are large libraries of books. Another category we'll talk about is steamer trunks, sewing machines, electronics. You're laughing. Sewing machines, electronics. This third group is porcelain figurines and the dreaded collector's plates. <laughs> Those, OK? Talk about that. We're going to talk a little bit also about silver plate. 
as opposed to, yeah, it's like, no way, no. Silver plate. We're going to talk about heavy, dark furniture. We're going to talk about linens. Linens. Everybody's got them. Linens. We're going to talk about sterling silver flatware and crystal or glass wine services. We're going to talk about photos and paper ephemera. Does everybody know what ephemera means? Yeah, it's the paper collectibles, for example, advertising and anything, old graphics, etc. So photos and paper ephemera. How many of you have family photos in the house? Oh, my God. Everybody here. We'll talk about that, and we're going to talk about China, formal China. Okay, so the general guidance on household collections is, and Deborah asked me to talk a little bit about this regards her family, but the general guidance I can offer you is many of your, your kids and grandkids will inherit these things, and then they'll say, let's give it to Goodwill, let's you do a garage sale, and they won't know what those objects are truly worth or what they meant to you. So I have two suggestions for you. Number one is get someone like John who's very used to doing a video either on your smartphone or a formal camera, etc., and go around your house and have somebody like John video you talking about your objects as you go around your house. And then you're going to make a CD, for example, for your kids or your heirs of you talking about those objects. And what that's called in my language is provenance. So you're going to talk about where those objects came from, if they're from your grandmother, what you think they're worth, et cetera, et cetera. You're also going to get somebody who is good with a still camera to take still pictures. Now, there's a method to my madness. Why are you saying, well, I need a video and I need a, sh a bunch of still pictures? Because if you've got more than one child or grandchild, what you can do is send them the video, but send them the still pictures as well and say, go through the still pictures and send back the things you want. After you look, looked at your video and look, look, they have the still pictures as a file. And I think you'll find it's really helpful. Why? Because everybody younger than, say, uh, 50 years old has been brought up on visual imagery. So all the talk and the description and the letters that you might write won't have the same impact as those still pictures. So those are, that's my, my big suggestion for you today, to approach the millennial generation with visual, visual images. Why? Because that's their language. And after I talk about the top 10 here, we're going to discuss um, more about downsizing hints. That's the second section of my talk, which is going to be called Elizabeth's Five Pile Downsizing Hints. The third section of my talk, I'm going to show you actual people in families where, that have come into our office with major problems about those top 10 objects I just told you about, of which China is one and paper is the other, etc. So I'm going to give you actual case studies about that. Uh, so books. Oh, and by the way, all these photos John took, and these are mostly, mostly things that I own. And by the way, I have a 30-year-old son who doesn't want any of them. <laughs> so books. Now, my hint for books is that this will not be a surprise to anyone in this room. But the more specific your field, the more valuable they might be. And what I'm saying is, for example, I did an appraisal for a professor here who studied a specific language that was only spoken on one island off of Japan. And he had a huge library about that language. It was very valuable because the field was very narrow. And we were able to target those two professors who actually were studying that somewhere on the East Coast. So what I mean is your general books, you know, like here I have Shelley's poems, for example, they're not going to be worth that much. And by the way, let me give you another hint. And I know we have a librarian here. Several. <laughs> Several librarians here. First editions are deceiving. Because if you see a book that's marked first edition, it may not be a first edition. It may be a reprint. Why is that? Because if you're going to have more than one edition, you don't know that when you're writing your first edition. 
you so so when you see first edition you have to sort of let me look at that my advice for books is if you have a library uh, this is a professor friend of mine he studies neo-colonial anthropology and his whole library is devoted to that this is another professor friend of mine and she studies the camera obscura in Dutch paintings of the 17th century. Her library is all devoted to that. Oh, I'm, too, I'm going too fast. I'm into steamer trunks. So what I mean about books is the narrower the subject, the more targeted your market could be if you're trying to get rid of books. Second category, we did books. Now, steamer trunks. How many of you have a hope chest or a steamer trunk in the house? A lot of people. I got something to tell you. This is a news flash. Your kids don't want them, and on the market, they're worth about $100 each. These are two of mine. This is huge. So that's the garage door in our house. That steamer trunk is about so high, it opens with all of the drawers and the, you know. And it's a beautiful thing, but you can't really sell it. Nobody really needs them. Nobody wants them. This is a leather uh, steamer trunk. Beautiful from the um, 1890s. Nobody really wants those. And every family has at least one. How many of you have sewing machines? Whoa. Whoa. Everybody's got a sewing machine. out. Do you think they're valuable? And the ones that are not valuable are all of them. And <laughs> the ones that are the very least valuable are the ones that you pump. And everybody shows me those. First thing I go in their house, like, look at this old treadle sewing machine. How valuable it must be. No, they're just not sewing machines. And old electronic stuff. Oh, yes, the steamer trunks. That's mine. That's yours? Yeah. I snuck into your house. I took that picture. <laughs> or John did. Uh, part of the category here is old electronic stuff. Now, there's some exceptions, and that's the grandson or granddaughter who's a nerd. And they may like, they actually may, may like this stuff. Here's an example of what a nerd might like. This is an old organ. It's one of those portable church organs. For the most part, they are very, they're not worth very much on the market at all. Okay, porcelain figurines. Unless they're Huschenreuther, Meissen, Dresden, etc., they're not worth anything. For example, the things that aren't worth anything, Hummels, Precious Moments. Does anyone know what those are? Mm -hmm. That's a good thing if you don't. Yeah. <laughs> Any kind of porcelain that isn't really high, high end, it's not a popular thing on the market. And they're very difficult to sell. Not a lot of market there. What I do for clients is if they've got a collection, you know the mom who has the trailer <clears throat> and she's got that bay window and she's got like 90 million frogs. <laughs> do you know the person I'm talking about? Yeah, that's an actual person. Oh yeah. <laughs> what I suggested to her son when he was downsizing for her is to take all those frogs and give them to a nursing home for gift exchange. Need I say more? Oh, God. Do you remember these? Oh, yeah. Bradford Exchange collector's plates. The worst, huh? They still do, it. They still do these? They should be shot. <laughs> anyway, the Bradford Exchange, I've had clients who have boxes and boxes. And you know they're beautiful themes. The themes are famous ballerinas, fairy stories, Princess Di. You've seen those, right? that those Norman Rockwell series. And they are worth absolutely nothing. This is thing for a gift exchange for the nursing home. Okay, now John took this photo of the silver plate objects in my house in the dumpster. Because, you see, because silver plate objects are very, very difficult to sell and they're difficult to give to your kids. Why do you think that is? That's right, they have to polish. Can they go in the microwave? No. Can they go in the dishwasher? No. no. And they deteriorate. And they deteriorate. And they deteriorate especially if you wrap them like I used to do in dry cleaning bags, you know, because the polycarbonate mixes with the silver and you get something that 
Do we have that picture, John? It's like two or three. Yeah. Down. These are some of the, um, the you know, we're going to talk, you know silver plate's different from sterling, right? So silver plate has a coating of silver. Sterling is, is 925 parts silver over 1,000. So the, this is all silver plate. People have tons of this, tons and tons. And it's just not worth much. And this is an example of how these things get when they're actually wrapped in plastic. Ooh. Yeah, and once they're that far gone, they're just, you have to throw them out. So silver plate. They melt, yeah, it melt it, it just like this black coating on it. You can't put them close to eggs. Pardon? You can't put silver close to eggs. Oh, that's, an, that's another. He says you can't put silver close to eggs. I had a client who had a beautiful set of silver, and she said, I want to give it to my granddaughter. And I called her granddaughter. I said, you know, your, your grandmother's going to give you this set of silver. And she said, I don't want it. I can't eat boiled eggs. I can't eat my soft boiled eggs. Have you tried? Have you tried eating soft boiled eggs with sterling? Ooh. It's a chemical reaction. Chemical reaction is very bad. Okay, so this is another category, heavy dark furniture. Heavy dark furniture, this is a sideboard. Uh, the sideboard is the worst of all heavy dark furniture because of course, what do you do with the sideboard? I'll tell you what you do with the sideboard. You put your formal china here and you put your sterling there. That's what you do with the sideboard. Now, we're gonna talk about formal china and sterling, but sideboards, for example, very difficult in the marketplace. Anything with a lot of carving and a lot of excess stuff to clean is really distasteful to the millennial group. They don't want well, they don't want heavy, dark furniture. Here's another example of furniture. This is in my house. My son likes it, but he wouldn't take it because he said to me, what do I do with it? It's not utilitarian. And may I introduce to you that there's a concept of value that's different from worth. And some of those, like I just mentioned the word utilitarian, ease of use, ease of cleaning, adaptability, lightness if in, a, in a move, for example. So there's a lot of furniture that will not work for the millennials because they don't have those sorts of values. And this is a beautiful piece. This, this is an aesthetic movement piece by Herter Brothers. It's dating 1880, 1890. Uh, wonderful piece, but you know, what, what do people do with these, th with these things? So this is difficult to sell on the market and your kids don't want it. Persian rugs. Textiles and uh, all kinds of Persian and ethnic textiles, textiles, very difficult. And people ask me, why? Why are they so difficult? I will tell you why. They always are multicolored and they're not Zen. My daughter-in-law says to me, uh, I want a Zen-like atmosphere in the house. So she wants kind of muted colors. Usually Persian rugs are anything but. Now with Persian rugs, remember I said books takes an expert? Persian rugs take an expert too because you can have the most beat up looking Persian rug and it's probably the most valuable piece in the house because uh, condition doesn't really matter with rugs because rugs were designed to be rugs. So Persian rugs, you need to call me or call a Persian rug expert. Uh, John, oh, I thought that's a kind of an interesting shot. He took a Persian rug and sat in the middle of the road at 6 o'clock in the morning. I think that's State Street. You see the colors. Can you imagine that in your daughter's, daughter's house? You see the, the, the Persian rugs are very difficult because they're designed for a different type, type of decor. People say to me, what do I do with my Persian rugs? I would suggest you try looking at East Coast auction houses because places like Martha's Vineyard, they're still popular, for example. And while we're on that subject, sometimes you can go and get a comparable value from that auction house and use that for the amount you're donating the piece for. And we can talk about that a little bit about donations. But Persian rugs needs an expert, good thing to donate. All right, now. Everybody's favorite, there's another Persian rug. This actually is a beautiful Persian prayer rug. You see the, the aspect of it is set, for, set up to face Mecca, for example. So it's a beautiful, beautiful rug, not worth a lot. 
We have a problem right now with the Middle East, and that has depressed the whole Persian rug market. Okay. Oh. Aren't these lovely? So you have the day of the week t dish towels. You can't live without these. I'm telling you, you've got to have these. How about the his and her embroidered pillowcases? Can you live without those? No. The linen napkins. Now, do you think your daughter-in-law wants those? No. Do you think your daughter-in-law has an ironing board? <laughs> do you think your daughter-in-law has an iron? Do you think your son does? This is a very difficult field to get rid of, to unload. Very difficult field to unload. Linens. Here's a client's linen closet. All these are beautiful linens. They're all linen linen, most of them. You know, as, differ, as different from uh, cotton. There's <laughs> linen linen. I suggested to this client that this client get in touch with wedding gown seamstresses and quinceanera seamstresses because they do shop for linen. And they do shop also for lace. And many of these, your great great aunt Louise made her pillowcases with Battenberg lace, didn't she? Everybody's great aunt Louise did. And you'll find that lace, you can sell that to people that actually make handmade wedding dresses. So that's one thing you can do with your linens. Okay, sterling silver flatware. Uh, there's two definitions of the value of sterling silver flatware. One is scrap, the other one is antique. Scrap value is if you take the, the, the sterling to a jewelry store and they weigh it by troy ounce. And they say, today sterling is worth X on the marketplace. We'll give you X for this collection. All right. Now, antique value is what that pattern, Chantilly, for example, what that pattern will go for on the market. And so you can actually weigh the difference. You can say, well, what is it worth in scrap value versus what the market will bear? And if you're interested, I can give you my card after the lecture. You can always call me. I can run a couple of comparable sales for you. And you can see what the market is going to bear for that pattern of yours. And by the way, <clears throat> most of my clients have two sets. So one husband's parents had one set. One wife's parents had another set. Usually there's two sets of sterling. I'm getting yes nods over here. Yeah, oh yeah. We have two sets. So sterling is either antique value or meltdown value or scrap value. And I will give you a hint that sterling later than 1930s is not going to be worth as much as sterling pre-1930s. That's because the relief is different. The relief, what I mean is the etching in the, in the etching. The relief is better and the weight is better. The weight, it's heavier. So older sterling is better. This is my sterling. John took it out to the beach. Isn't that cool? Yeah. Isn't that cool? Now, this is the um, stamp on mine. Mine is from my great-grandmother in Germany, and this is German silver, so it's 800 parts silver over 1,000. It's another category, but still in the category of sterling. Oh, uh, yeah, this is a client that wanted to sell the sterling. That's how much he didn't sell. All right. Along with uh, closely related to sterling is formal uh, sets of glassware. This started in the 1930s where cocktails were invented. I should say 1920s, 1930s. And cocktails were invented and there were forms for the cocktails. So you had a Manhattan glass, you had a rocks glass, you had a Sours glass, etc. That all happened in the 20s and the 30s. And then all of a sudden people started to discover that it would be nice to have a whole set. And so you got waters, red wines, white wines, and all the beverage sets. You got cordials. And you got these champagne glasses that maximized the surface area, so you had maximum bubbles up your nose. <laughs> when I showed these, these are mine, when I showed these to my son, I said, would you like these? These are great. He's like, where's the flutes? <laughs> <laughs> this is a form that you cannot give to your grandkids, you can't give to your kids. It's a difficult form. This is a full set, a lot of pieces. I'd like to tell you I have 12 of each. No, I have eight white wines, I have five red wines, I have three waters, you know. Now the other thing my daughter-in-law said to me is, no way, because this holds two sips of wine. They're little. And that's not your usual wine imbibing. 
kind of glass. Also, our wine glasses today have curved inward, so we're trying to capture the bouquet of the wine. This is just the wrong thing altogether. You'll find a lot of these sets at thrift stores. And you'll find them four pieces of this, five pieces of that, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, here's another client set, full set. All right, now our favorite thing in the world is formal china. Now I have in my house a Thanksgiving service. I have a Christmas service. I have a luncheon service in Haviland. I have two dinner services. This is, here's my dinner service here. I bought this off of Sid Sharif. Do you know Sid Sharif? She was, she was a dancer. I bought this from her um, secretary. And this is Wedgwood, and it's expensive. It was expensive. Now I can sell the whole set for $200, $300. It's just not, why is it not popular? Do you know? Dishwasher. Dishwasher, microwave. But the other thing is, your kids and grandkids, well, uh, my kids and grandkids, this is what they said. Do you think we want to get China out for one night of the year? <laughs> What's the point? They don't want to bring it out. They don't want to resource it for one night of the year. It's just, this, this is the most depressed area of all the market is formal China across the board. And finally, these are my family photos. Uh, let's see, there's me as, see there's me as a baby. There's me in that puffy dress there. Uh, so family photos, what do you do with those? Any hints? Put them on a CD. Yeah, I, I was gonna say, you can scan them, but once you scan them, what do you do with them? <laughs> what do you do with them once you scan them? Because it's your memories. I mean, someone said over here, put them on the street. But it's hard, isn't it? It's like, whoa, these are my family memories. So I have a, I have a few hints. See, there I am. I look the same. Shorter. I'm shorter, yeah. yeah. My grandfather was a great one for Super 8. Beautiful photograph of photographs. My cousin, Cecilia. Oh, too fast. So what I would suggest with those is you can research greeting card companies that use really fun family photos and they will buy them. So once you scan them and you, scan, you can scan your, your historical material, <coughs> did you notice the green stamps? Did you notice? Oh, okay, we'll have to go back and show you the green stamps. My mom was a huge green stamp collector. See, in the upper corner? Green stamps, and so you can scan all that and you know, give them, and that's the, that's the best this lady said, scan, I would totally agree. There's my mom. All right, so now comes the second part of the talk, the five piles, Elizabeth's five pile theory of downsizing. So I'll preface this by saying I know from whence I speak because I, I'm a little bit of a collector, as you might think, and I have a storage locker. When I opened the storage locker 10 years ago, it was $95 a month. Nine years later, it was $350 a month. Do we have any mathematic mathematicians in? <laughs> Can I tell you it was over $20,000 in nine to 10 years in storage locker fees? And that is not uh, unheard of. And that's me, and I know how to downsize. So, but the thing is with a storage locker, what I discovered, I went and tackled this storage locker that had a lot of memories. <clears throat> and I thought to myself, this is gonna be easy because I counsel people all day long how to get rid of things, where to sell them, et cetera. And what I did was I said, okay, let me clean out part of the house because I'll move some of the storage locker stuff in the house. Bad idea. <laughs> because what you're doing is just shifting stuff around, right? You're, 
So what I developed was my five pile theories theory. And what my thought is that you start with your first pile, not literally a pile, but you start with your first category. So the, if you can think of this as a typology, you start with your first category being the stuff that is really worth researching. And I give you an example. Here's stuff, you can see how big these things are. These are big French advertising posters. They belong to me, they're huge. This is stuff that's really worth researching because on the market, these are 2,000 and up. So now once you start to know how markets work in material and objects, you're like, okay, now I got it. I know how to research because there's a lot of research available on such things. Good paintings is another thing to start with. Start with learning how to research the best you have. Do you want to sell? Once you find out the value, you might decide, yes, I do want to sell. So learn how to research the best you have. You might say, Elizabeth, you're out of your mind. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go through the house with a lot of cardboard boxes and make the pile in the garage for the garage sale. Don't do that. You know what will happen? You'll make the pile in the garage sale for the garage sale in the garage. You'll wake up at 3 in the morning one morning and you'll say, you know, I'm only going to get $10 for that anyway. And you'll walk out to the garage and you'll bring it back in the house. So the thing to do is start with the best you have. You'll learn how to research that way. The next category of your typology is going to be the things you really, really want to donate and that are worthy of donation. The IRS, of course, you can get a non-cash charitable contribution if you donate. And if you donate, you should be aware that you should give like things to like institutions. So art to art museums, books to libraries, etc. And don't give things that are not like that institution's mission. Give things that have parity with that mission. The reason being is the IRS has a little bit of a funny exclusion or inclusion on the 8283 form, which is the form that uh, I would fill out for you for a charitable contribution donation deduction. And it asks you, is this matching kind of in words to this effect? Does it match the mission? As a matter of fact, I'll tell you a funny story about that. So I had a woman, uh, she was probably 35, and she was hired to nurse an 85-year-old man who in the last week of his life, very wealthy man, in the last week of his life married her. Now, aren't you shocked? This has never happened before. <laughs> he married her. She inherited everything. And he was a collector of Remington bronzes. Do you know what Remington bronzes are? OK, so we had two Remington bronzes taller than I that were um, the cowboys on big mounted horses, like this. They were about to shoot something. So both of them, big, life size, life size. And after she had uh, inherited all this money in this big house in Montecito, she said, OK, let me give to the charity I most have a heart for. What was that charity? It was the Battered Women's Shelter. She tried to give two Remington bronzes. Oh, <laughs> I said, you know, there's this thing that's the parody of, you know, it should be like to like. She said, Elizabeth, I won't hear of it. I want them to go to the battered women's shelter. End of story, make it work. So I actually talked to them and I said, wouldn't it be nice if she donated some money to make two concrete plinths at the um, entryway of two people, you know, two cowboy students? <laughs> they bought it. They said, yeah, great, let's do it. So there, there is a battered women's shelter, not in Santa Barbara, but I can't tell you where, with two Remington bronzes guarding the entry door. If you remember, like things go to like organizations. And when you do a donation, you should be thinking about whether or not the object is ever going to be shown. So I always tell people that come to me and say, I, re I really want to give it to the Met, or I want to give it to LACMA. You know where it's going to end up? Basement. Basement. If you give it to the smaller museums, you have a much better chance of it actually being enjoyed. So find donations. Next category, family jewels. Now, not necessarily, not necessarily your jewelry, but the family jewels could be 
your best paintings, the things you really want to stay in the family. And those, do you remember I talked to you about getting that video together? About your things that you want to stay in the family, tell your heirs what they are on that video so that they don't think, oh, it's just, oh, this is probably costume jewelry. As a matter of fact, this is mine, all this stuff is mine, and most of it I found in costume jewelry uh, boxes at thrift stores, and it's, it's not costume jewelry at all. But many people don't know how to tell the difference. So, you know, with jewelry, with fine paintings, with really important books, for example, talk about that on the video that you're going to give to your kids. And it may be something like, ah, oh, you know, I've got four kids. I don't want, I just give the video to all four kids. And when the time comes, you can ask them what I call in our business equitable distribution. You can ask them to all pick something where it all balances value-wise in the end. And usually you're going to need a professional, a lawyer, or an appraiser to kind of walk you through that. But the family jewels are the, the pile that you should most document visually. And why is that important? It's important for two reasons. How many of you have insurance? for appreciable merchandise. I'm not talking about depreciable. You have appreciable. One person, two, peop two people in the room. Appreciable merchandise is different from depreciable. Depreciable means the Herculon sofa, the computer, stuff that goes down in value. Appreciable means going up in value over the years. That is the stuff that's going to increase. Good paintings, good jewelry, good books, etc. Rare books, I should say. Very few of my clients have ever photographed or videoed their best things that they want their heirs to inherit. And while you're doing the um, five piles theory, if you're downsizing, a great time to get someone like John to come over and just do a whole sweep of those things. Give the CD to your insurance agent and say, by the way, I know these are appreciable. Why do I say that to you? because I was expert witness in many cases over the fires that we had. And the insurance companies, which by the way, have the tallest building in any given town, <laughs> insurance companies like to say, well, she never said it was appreciable. And guess what they'll do? They'll take depreciation. Now that hurts if you've got a, Chip a Chippendale sofa from 1770, because it depreciates to about $5. So, so the thing is, if you make, when you do your video like this, you mentioned, say, this I know will go up in value and give it to your insurance agent as well as your kids. And ask your insurance agent, don't you think it's time that we just put a rider, you know what a rider is? R-I-D-E-R, rider coverage with your homeowners. Really worth it. Have I done it? No. <laughs> now, now, your keepers. Things that you're moving to your new place or things that you know you like so much that you have to have them. I, this is my um, glass collection. And these are the candlesticks that my son had on his altar when he was married. And these sorts of things I will never get rid of because I just love them. And I know these are my keepers. As regards my keepers, uh, I need to give my own advice and I need to actually video these and photograph these as well, which I haven't done. But this is, these are my keepers. And I would suggest you do that. If you're going to be moving to a new footprint of a house, it's very important that you take photographs of these things so that you can bring those photographs to your new place. Why? I'll tell you. Exactly. It may not work. The quality of light, especially in Santa Barbara, changes from the Riviera to the beach, the light is so different. And um, this lady was asking me, wow, did you see that huge, great, big taxidermy moose head that I was appraising? Why did it end up here? Well, they had a house in Colorado. It looked great in Colorado. It looked terrible on the beach here. <laughs> Quality of light. So it's important to, to, with your keepers, you know, if you're really good with a computer, you can get a CAD system where you can lay out your new house and see how the proportions work. But every new space is a different quality of light, and you're going to find some of your stuff that you loved is going to look terrible in the new house. So it's a good test market. And finally, this is what I call your piddly smalls. And I know we've got one British gentleman here, so you know what piddly is. 
Yeah, it's piddly, it's, it's kind of your piddly smalls. Your piddly smalls are what goes in the garage. And this is what you're going to earmark for a garage sale. When you've got it all in one particular area, you are going to say, all right, now I'm going to have a garage sale or not. My suggestion is don't bother. Don't bother having a garage sale. You are going to spend at least a week of your life having a garage sale. People are going to mob you at 5 in the morning. It's not worth it because your average garage sale returns are, is about $2,000. So it's not worth it to do a garage sale. It's not worth the hassle. And frankly, it's not worth the exposure. Um, we actually were the appraisers on record for Jonathan Winters. Do you remember this, the no. famous community? So his family and, and our office were talking about, well, should we do a sale? They wisely decided not to do a sale in his home because of the liability issues. Many of my clients have been sued by people that have tripped over a rug at a garage sale. True. Well, it's true. And so it may not be worth it in the end. My suggestion is to donate those things. Take photos when you donate. And if you're donating things that are under 2,000 or actually under five, if there's a group and it's under 5,000, you can actually, you don't have to call me, you can actually get a receipt from the organization for Goodwill or your church or whatever. You can get a receipt saying, you know, you donated and then you fill in the value. If you need help with filling in the value, of course our office can help, but you don't need me unless you're donating over $5,000 worth of stuff. Now the IRS is funny like that because our office has been questioned on the category between $2,000 worth of stuff and $5,000 worth of stuff because the IRS finds that that's the area in which there's most margin for overstating the value. What do I mean? I had a call yesterday from a gentleman and he said, my mom has left me three fur coats and I think uh, I need an appraisal. And I said, well, you know, those three coats have got to be valued at over 5,000 for you to actually want to have me work for you because, you know, if you're gonna donate them, you really don't need me. And he said, oh no, I'm sure. I'm absolutely sure they're over 5,000. So I said, fine, I'll be happy to do the appraisal. I did the appraisal. What are they worth? Three, about 300, I said 250 to $300, which was my fee. I said, look, you know, you didn't need me. I didn't charge him in the end, by the way. But this is, this is the category where I'm trying to convince you is don't, with the piddly smalls, don't worry about them. And I will tell you, look at me very closely. I'm going to say something that you guys will remember for the rest of your life. The smaller the object and the lesser the value of the object, the greater the psychic space it occupies. <laughs> Very true. I've been doing this such a long time. It's not the big stuff. Can you imagine how long does it take for you to buy a new car versus get rid of that ceramic chicken that Aunt Mabel left you? <laughs> Whole different scenario. Now, the third part of our lecture, the Piddly Smalls, third part of our lecture, remember I promised you some case studies. So I would like for you to meet Brooke's mom. She's at the door of her house and she is going to be talking to Brooke and Tony, her grandchildren, about her fine china. And she's opening the door to her house. Here's Brooke and Tony. Brooke and Tony, uh, you know, they have their uh, Airstream trailer there and they're going to go through the china and I'm going to help them go through the china. So here I am. I'm helping them go through the china. What do you think they selected? Definitely. You're absolutely right. So this is, this is my, my previous book. This came out this, this past November. Um, that's Collect, Value, Divest, What to Collect, How to Assess Value, When and Where to Sell. Um, and now my new book, do you know what the title is? No. It's called No Thanks, Mom. <laughs> It's no thanks, mom, the objects your heirs do not want to inherit. So th these, are, these are photos of clients of mine from the book, and I've been interviewing 
people for years about this topic. And so this, so this is what John is saying. These are, it's a sneak preview into the new book. All right, meet Kelly and her daughter. Now, Kelly and her daughter live on a very fashionable street in Brooklyn. She's a single mom. And here's Kelly's mom. And Kelly's mom is an antique lover. She absolutely adores sterling flatware. And uh, she is going to be asking Kelly whether or not she wants that flatware. What do you think Kelly's going to say? No, no thanks, thanks, Mom. No thanks, Mom. OK, I'd like you to meet Laura and her husband. They live in Carpinteria. Now they're, as you can see, they're kind of retro. Do you know what retro means? So they're kind of retro. They're very cool. Um, their Aunt Rebecca, here's Aunt Rebecca. There's Aunt Rebecca. Aunt Rebecca was a seamstress, and she loved to embroider linens. Now, let's look at Tony and uh, Laura, Laura and her husband. Do you think Laura and her husband want his and her pillowcases? They do want the cocktail napkins, the ones with the little rooster on them that says one more drink. You know, they want those. There's their poor aunt, the Aunt Rebecca, the seamstress. All right. Now, this will touch a lot of you, this story. This is Emily and John, and this is John at his doctoral dissertation, right after his defense at Harvard. And Emily's mom was, she, she actually adored John. And Emily's mom turned the house that they had grown up in uh, to a bed and breakfast to support John getting his doctorate. And so here's the mom. This is Emily's mom. And on this sideboard, because it was a bed and breakfast for years, she served breakfast to help John out in grad school. All right. Now, John's just gotten a job at Berkeley, his first teaching job. And um, do you think he wants the sideboard <laughs> at Berkeley? No. All right. Now, do you remember we talked about silver plate? Here is the wedding party that gave my client 40 odd pieces of silver plate. Relish dishes, lasagna pan Pyrex holders, covered vegetables, what else? Tea sets, uh, gravy boats. Trays. Trays, oh, a lot of trays. What else in, in silver plate? Can you think of anything else? Oh, um, cranberry jelly, pots. Oh. Serving pieces, sugar, sugar, and sugar and creamer. What else in, in service? Salt, 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 salt and pepper. And by the way, the salt's going to be destroyed because the salt inside, yeah. All right. Anyway, so this is the wedding party that gave my client over 50 pieces of silver plate. All right. Now, the, the, the woman who was married at this time, her name was Nell. And Nell decided that it wouldn't it be fun to polish up all the silver plate from 1960 something and use it in her daughter's wedding. And here's her daughter. That's Mari. Okay. That's Mari. And she invited Mari. Uh, and Mari's intended over to the house to discuss the uh, wedding shower. And she said, I'm going to be polishing up 50 pieces of, stir of silver plate for you. It's going to be gorgeous. The buffet table would be gorgeous, fantastic. So here's Mari's um, future wife. So there's Mari's wife. And Mari and Louise decided to say absolutely no. Our lifestyle is not such that we want to entertain on silver plate. And by the way, we are actually moving. Big surprise. They're telling now, we are moving to a trailer. We are going to be traveling the country for a couple of years. We don't want 50 pieces of silver plate. <laughs> All right. Now, meet Randy's mom. Randy's mom loved porcelain figurines. She had a ton of porcelain figurines. She also had a lot of collector plates. And she lived in a double wide in Santa Paula. Uh, and I met her there. We looked at her figurines. She treasured every last one of them. And here is her son. There's one of the collector's plates there. The son here is explaining to me 
what the heck do I do with these? And he just didn't want them. He didn't know what to do with them. He very carefully was downsizing all the collector's plates. And in the end, I said, just let's take them together. We'll take them to a nursing home. But he happened to be quite a good photographer. He had an expensive camera in the car with him that day. And he said, you know, before I give them away, I'm going to take some really interesting photos. So he kept the photos to remember his mom by. So that was a way that he actually, you know, he was actually able to remember her collection in a respectful way. Okay, now I want you to meet Ellie's great-grandparents. These are Ellie's, no, great-great-grandparents. They owned a steamer trunk in 1889. Now, here's Ellie's grandmother. Ellie's grandmother wants that wants Ellie to have the steamer trunk. Now, a little bit about Ellie. Ellie's a student nurse. She just finished her training at City College and she's got her first position at Cook County Hospital in, New York, in um, Chicago. She found a place on the 18th floor of a high rise in Chicago. Here's Ellie. Do you think she wants the steamer trunk? There's Ellie. Do you think she wants the steamer trunk? No. All right, now this is Joan and her husband in 1970, and um, she actually inherited from her mom boxes and boxes of, of photos, lots of photos. He inherited from his mom boxes of photos. Between them, they had five huge boxes of family photos. They were earmarked for Joan's brother, David. Now, Joan's brother, David, is one of these people. Here's David. David's a folk guitarist in Ventura. And uh, David is one of these people that likes historical instruments. And so Joan thought, OK, he's probably going to want the, um, the, family, the family photos. Uh, he doesn't want them. He wants them scanned. But before Joan scanned them, what she did was she went through the whole box. And that's, that's actually me looking with her at some of her class photos. She decided to scan them and give them to her brother that way. So here we have Mary's grandmother, whose great uncle collected Persian rugs in the Raj years. So he was in India in the Raj years. He collected Persian rugs. He'd go, uh, go eat on his, his weekends, and he'd collect, he collected thousands of pieces of Persian rugs. Now, this is, this is her daughter. And you see her house has some of the Persian rugs. And now her sister and her husband have other Persian rugs. And now what is the, um, the situation is that there's a young woman in the family. And here she is. This is Mary. And Mary is in Raleigh-Durham. She's working on her PhD at Duke. And she's in Raleigh-Durham. She's restoring an old North Carolina farmhouse. And she wants it peaceful. She wants the floors unfinished. She wants everything very sparse and farmhousey and clean. And does she want the Persian rugs? Now, here's something we talked about before. This is Nancy. She's the otter, artist daughter. There's Nancy. That's me with her baby and her husband. Nancy is the artist daughter of a professor from this university. I don't know if he's retired or not. But I'd like you to meet them. You met them once before. Here's Dr. Lizzo, and remember I told you with his French neoclass and uh, neo-colonialist archive. Here's Dr. Vandernoot with her uh, Dutch camera obscura archive, and here is her ancestor uh, who wants her to take his Russian photography and philosophy archive. Here he is. This is Dr. Wellington. Doesn't he look like a Russian uh, scholar? <laughs> Huh? He wants these people, he wants to give his Russian photography and philosophy to these folks. Do you think, uh, do you think that they'll accept his library? So I guess what I'm saying to you while I'm going through these really interesting case studies of families that I've known and worked with is that the object is the family, and the family is the object, unless it's not. You see? So maybe that's something you can take away. 
My final bit of my talk, and I thank you for your attention, is the 10 valuable habits of successful downsizers. And very quickly, I'm gonna give you the 10 top hints for successful downsizing. If you're moving, it's the same as if you're lightening your load or giving to your heirs. What you're going to think to yourself is your objects don't define who you are to your kids. And, and a lot of times, I'm speaking from, um, I'm a past master of this because I tried to sneak attack my son with all these boxes that I'd send in the mail. And it's like, oh, mom just sent us a box. It doesn't work because I was trying to say, look, these things were important to me. They maybe should be important to you, but it's okay if they're not. And I learned that kind of the hard way. It really is okay if they're not. Objects don't define your worth. They don't define your essence. And why that is is interesting. It's an interesting philosophical phenomenon because the idea about house and home has changed. And we are as much responsible in my generation as anyone else because I moved probably every couple of years. I had a number of partners through my life. I mean, there was no one particular home. And so my son doesn't have that same idea as I have with my grandmother's kitchen. He doesn't remember which kitchen reminds him best of home. You see, so that generation's idea of home has changed. And value is no longer, as we said before, simply worth. Here's some different definitions of value. Ease of life adaptability, status, style, livability, functionality, short-term pleasure, and a term that I've learned recently from my millennials, the humble brag. <laughs> what is a humble brag? It's when you can post something on Facebook and say, oh, I really, you know, it's very cool, I used it, I like it, and you're humbly bragging about it. And there are not a lot of categories of objects that fall into the humble brag for the millennials. And for most of the humble brag, it's limited to technology. So you see the humble brag is, is di okay, downsizers. Number one, make a plan. They limit their work time and they give themselves rewards like a big glass of wine or a big pound of chocolate after the day is over. If you can say to yourself, I can stand getting in my storage locker or going through my closet for four hours on a Saturday, and after that, I'm doing something really special, you can do it. And it'll take you a while, but you'll be surprised. It'll get done. You make a downsize, good downsizers make a visual picture, and by that I mean, they actually try to sketch if they're moving. They'll sketch, oh yeah, let me put this dresser here and this dresser there. I say that from experience because when I moved, I, dr I dragged everything to the new place and I thought, okay, let me see if I can fit it in. Well, I spent, let's see, $2,000, $3,000 for a moving truck and then just that much again for the moving guys. And in the end, I, that was $6,000 I didn't need to spend because I just gave it to the moving guys and said, get, get this out of here, we're done work. So um, make a sketch or you know, get somebody who's good with a computer to make a sketch. Remember that every place you go has a different quality of light. Your art's gonna look different. Everything's gonna look different in the new place. When you have a donation discussion with yourself and you're arguing with yourself and you make a decision to donate, make a pact with yourself, shake your own hand saying that donation decision is permanent. Good downsizers use experts. They use people that help them sell on eBay. They use short-term movers and short-haul movers that just go like between here and the storage locker, of which I think Steve's delivery service is really good, by the way, in town here. They use flea market people. We hire, for our office, we hire people that like to go to flea markets at four in the morning and sell for people. They're, so downsizers, good downsizers use their experts. They, um, they have in the back pocket their escape plan. By the escape plan is they've got one charity that they know of where that charity owns a truck and supplies moving guys. So if they get fed up, they can call that charity and say, take it. And it, it, it's really helpful to have one charity that has a truck and moving guys. Good downsizers, number six, avoid using spouses. They never <laughs> use the spouse because I have found that in any given couple, there's one stuffed person and one non-stuffed person. And the non-stuffed person will stand there like this in the storage locker. 
<laughs> it's pointless. They're pointless. You can't use them. So avoid using spouses. If you've got to use somebody at the move at the move at your house or the storage locker or your garage, if you've got to use somebody, hire somebody for $35 an hour or do a favor for a friend and make sure that person is a stuff person so that you're not going to stand there and be like, oh, let me go through memory lane with you. You're, you see, so good downsizers have always a maybe pile and they don't kill themselves when they have a maybe pile. They say, maybe this will work, maybe I'll use it, but what they say to themselves is, I'm going to store that maybe pile for three months. After three months, I'm gonna revisit it. If I haven't used it or haven't thought about it, once in three months, it goes. But they don't kill themselves for having a maybe pile. Good downsizers, number eight, take advantage of non-cash charitable contributions that the IRS allows. And the area in which they allow it, of course, is anywhere from zero to 5,000 that you can take and make the value yourself. Between 2,000 and 5,000, my suggestion is to give a, an appraiser like myself a call so we can double check so you don't get audited. Number nine, good downsizers, do not visit the objects they intend to let go after a glass of wine. And number 10, good downsizers have one go-to charitable organization that will truck almost anything away. John and I in our office love Second Story Associates, and that's because they're associated with the Housing Authority here in Santa Barbara. They have their own trucks, and they need everything in a house, in a starter home, everything. And in some cases, it's pretty surprising what they'll take because they, you know, if, if you have nothing, you need everything. So. Second Story Associates, yeah. And in conclusion, and I wanna give you five, 10 minutes to ask me questions, but in conclusion, you, the, the, this era is an era of taste shifting and t it, tastes are really, really shifting. I see this so much in my practice because I've been doing this for 29 years. I've been an appraiser. So uh, the taste is shifting. The aesthetics of prevailing technology, what I call the Steve Jobs aesthetics, the really clean lines, functionality, that is the taste right now. Um, people are using, instead of the paintings on the wall, the millennials would rather have photos, and that's an indication of the kind of language that they speak. They speak visual. They don't speak narrative. So we don't want to hit them with a narrative history of here's, this is your grandmother's blah, blah. You want to show them pictures, show them pictures. When you, when your mom left her stuff to you, you didn't have a choice in what she willed in her will to you, did you? She just left you things. It's different now. It's different. We're living longer. Our kids have the vet vetting option. Our kids and grandkids, uh, you know, have that vetting option of saying, no, I, I prefer not to have it. And you don't want to get into like an argument over stuff on, on that level anyway. And then finally, in conclusion, um, I mentioned this once before. One of the worst things, oh, do we have more storage lockers? One of the worst things you can do, uh, see, these are all different moves that John and I have helped with over the year, years. Um, Many of these, there's my storage locker keys. And there's me saying thank you. <laughs> uh, what I would suggest that you would not do is what I said before, the sneak attack in the mail. Just the box wrapped up and sent to your kids. It, it just is, it will backfire every time. But anyway, I thank you for your kind attention and it's been an honor to speak to UCSB. And I'm gonna bow. And then I'm going to ask you if you have any questions for me. Thank you. You didn't mention tools. <laughs> Do you want to talk about tools? I'll take them. <laughs> I don't think I'm the right person to talk about getting rid of tools. No, he's definitely not. So tools fall into a couple categories. Number one, there's the antiquarian tools. And there's the tools that are really specific. And I'll tell you, um, my example is, I had a gentleman that uh, brought a pig scraper to an appraisal. I did like an antique road show. I do a lot of antique road shows. 
and he bought a, brought a pig scraper and he said, I bet you don't know what this is. And it's a, a bell-shaped uh, metal, like round can looking thing on a big stick and you kind of, you scrape the pig, so pig scraper. Now that is worth a lot because there's not a lot of pig scrapers out there. And <laughs> it's true, rarity, rarity is always an indication of value. So rarity is always that fraction, uh, that's the bottom end of the fraction, so value over rarity. And um, if you've got things that are rare and very narrow, like we talked about with books, things that are rare and narrow, you're going to find a, a vital market. And you'll find it through technology. You won't find it on eBay. You'll find it through various chat rooms and blogs about that particular type of tool. Um, what type are you speaking of exactly? Cars? Shop? Shop. Shop. So there's a society for people that do woodworking. And it's, you know about it? Okay, so it's an antiquarian society for woodworkers and they have beautiful, beautiful things. And they talk about them in, in anything. The, I can tell you about things like tools and things very specific. We're talking about narrow market for a library. The closer you can get, the narrower you can get, the idea is to have two people at an auction that want it the, the, the worst fighting with each other for it. If you can narrow the market, see, you think of eBay eBay is one of those things, it's like a, um, what's the, with the two types of guns? There's the shotgun and the rifle. eBay is the shotgun. What you want to do is the rifle. You want to target it just to the person who wants those kind of tools. Get really, really, really narrow. Look at the collector's clubs. That's your best bet, is to look at your collector's clubs um, that only collect Zippo lighters or only collect pig scrapers, or only collect Martin ukuleles, for example. And those are the people you want to get really narrow. That's, that's going to shoot your value up. Yes? We talked about glass collections and how basically valueless they are, both to people who might get them and on the market. What about crystal? Is that the same thing? Yeah, so crystal has more lead in it, and crystal um, the days of cut crystal, we used to call it American Brilliant, where, you know, it's, it's, you know what American Brilliant looks like. Those days are over and people don't collect that anymore. So American Brilliant, you know, everybody had like the fruit ball in their grandmother's house, American Brilliant. That is really difficult and usually that stuff is, um, has been damaged over the year, years with faucet dings. You know, always get dinged up. So that's not that valuable. The crystal that is valuable, Stuben. Any kind of mid-century modern look. And Stuben was the king of that. Stuben, um, New York, uh, of course, Tiffany. Any crystal, Baccarat, huge, Lalique, big. Any of the crystal that has not the fussy look, but the geometric look. Stuben's got a, a, a design that dates from, I think, 1950s, and it's just a triangle on a little sort of pad of glass. Has anyone seen those? Absolutely hot. Nothing terrible, awful, no value, very little value, especially since Waterford sold, I guess it was like five years ago to a Chinese concern. Nope. When you have a, um, when you have a market depression in one object class, I'm getting very technical here, when you get a, have that in one object class, it depresses the whole market. So usually, so if Waterford sold, even the antique Waterford, the exception is going to be the Irish Waterford chandeliers. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, something I learned, and this is not about getting any money for it, but um, I've stumbled across some things where um, I was a figure skater when I was younger, and I skated at Michigan State, who had Olympic skaters that skated there in the summer, and yeah. I had collected all these programs and everything. Cool. And I had contact with Michigan State. They, when they discovered I had these things and I'd saved them. They, oh, I'm sure they were over years, the moon, yes. They wanted everything I had, and that's historic. They're not going to display it, but they didn't even know the history. And then when I was on campus one time, they sat down and they let me tell all my memories and they recorded everything. That's right. And that is and, great. That's and, great. And I found something else. A half brother of my mother's was um, 
got some kind of illness and there was a medal or something, one of those World War II, I guess, or something, and he died of the flu epidemic. Yeah. And that was attached to University of Michigan, and they're interested in having whatever I found. And the way I find these things out is I call and I say, I have this, do you want this? Yes. And it's not that it's going to be displayed, but I don't have to keep it. Yes. And I can get ready. And you don't know whose dissertation it's going to be. Yeah. Because, you know. Care, but I can get rid of it. Yeah. And so I sometimes call, and the same with my mother's high school album. Yes. They wanted that, and that was for Jackson, Michigan, and I sent it off. Yes. Out of my house. This is a great example. Thank you for bringing that up because it's an example. Remember I was saying the narrower you can target. So your, you know, your alma mater, your high school, I mean, the narrower you can target, the more likely it is to be appreciated. And also if you're selling it, the higher value you're going to get by going the higher, targeting that market. And you'd exactly right. Exactly. We did a, um, an appraisal uh, for, for UCSB, a professor here who did, um, had an incredible archive on water rights. And we donated his archive, uh, or my family, the family donated his archive, and we did the valuation for the archive. And working with the university was so helpful because they wanted it. They had at least two or three people that were doing a dissertation on water rights that were standing in the wings waiting for the archive. So the narrower you can get with your objects, just like you did, that's, that's the best placement. Yeah, and you just get on the internet and I found some obscure women's organization in Michigan. I found it, just a paper thing, and they were thrilled. It was the earliest thing that that women's organization had. Great thought, great thinking. Great thinking, and you know it's in good hands. Yeah. yeah. And they were thrilled. They didn't know it existed. And you can also, if you get real creative, um, we, we do this for clients. We find the, the comparable value of similar archives, very narrow like that, and then people can take that as a, as a, as a non-cash charitable contribution deduction off their, off their income. So, yes. Um, uh, my husband's parents were oriental antique dealers and ah, they passed away, so yeah. we have a lot of their stuff. And uh, what I was wondering about you as an appraiser, do you, you know, do you have like, do you do everything or are there people that deal in antiques in a specific part of the world? Yeah, so this is why I knew I'd like coming and speaking to you guys because you're all so bright. That's a great question. So appraisers, and Suzanne, she's my intern, she was sitting back there, she, she was, um, she's working on her certificate. It's about a five year um, course of study, you usually have to have an advanced degree in art history or some, some related field. But what we are taught is how to research. So the methodology is important. And then we are also taught to be really meticulous about who knows what. So we are great resources, for example, if someone said, uh, what do you know about women's figure skating in the 1960s? I would know who to contact for, for that. So we have, do you remember in those days when you say we have a really good Rolodex? Yeah. <laughs> so we are, we are, we're great at knowing the techniques of researching any, or we're supposed to be, any specific object class and then who the experts are to go to. So we know enough to stop ourselves and say, okay, now I need an expert opinion. <clears throat> but you know, there's different methods for appraising for insurance as, um, <clears throat> excuse me, charitable contributions, fair market value, for divorce, for bankruptcy, for, for cases regarding the banks, for example. So there's a, a lot of different methods of research. And then there's a lot of statistical analysis that regards you know, what comparable sales you use. Because it's not like your house where you can say, oh, the house next door, we're going to pick the three comparables and we're going to make our house assign this value. Because with many of the things we do, it's, um, there isn't any comparable, uh, you know, especially in works of uh, fine art. There's just not a comparable for a painting. So we generally have eight areas of comparables, color, medium, structure, era, da, 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 da. And so we match those as close as we can. And then when we match them, we say, Mr. Expert, what do you think? Have we done a good job? So um, we're not necessarily good at everything, but I feel like uh, 
what I've seen in this industry for you know almost 30 years, I can at least tell you who's the expert to go to. And, but the expert might not n know how to write to the IRS or how to write to the bank or how to write to the court, for example. And so how we do that is we structure for, for whatever, whatever job it is. Does that answer? Yes. Um, my mother-in-law was a concert harpist, and I have a harp sitting in my living room. I have no idea the value. It's, it's early 1900s. It's Hawaiian Healy. It's full size. And I don't know. I need to get an evaluation of it. Do you do things like that? Yes. We can definitely do that. Uh, once you get the, just if you don't mind asking or telling, once you get an evaluation, have you decided what you want to do with it? I'm trying to decide. I, I had thought about giving it to West Pond or, or music school, but it's my daughter is very attached to it. So I don't know. Yet. So you need to insure it in that case. I do. I'm the head. So to, to, to reflect back to this question, that's uh, what we would do in a case of that, like that. We would go to retail value and not, um, so we'd go to, uh, what you would need to buy, uh, how much money you need to buy a harp like that, that's insurance value, as opposed to what it would look like if it was sold on the secondhand market. Two different values. So we would go to two to completely different values. And if you told me insurance, I would go retail for her. And I would then research the retail secondhand harp uh, uh, market for you. Um, they can be valuable. They can be valuable. Very large wooden case that's been taking up the page of the garage for years. <laughs> well, another thing we get a lot, and John helps us a lot with this, is that um, we get people asking, "What do I do with my piano?" And um, we have found we have found with pianos that the best thing to do is to try the Santa Barbara Bowl Foundation. Music Academy used to take pianos; they no longer do. They buy their own brand new Steinways now. And so if you've got an, a, um, an older piano, um, what the Santa Barbara Bowl Foundation does is an outreach to schools. And they'll place a piano in any school and it uprights to grands. We've placed, well, the king of all Steinway, 19, 19, 19, 1919 Steinway uh, Concert D, we placed in a school in Lompoc. And they were thrilled, 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 thrilled. So piano. So Music Academy, found, or excuse me, Santa Barbara Bowl Foundation is a good one for that. Yeah. Any other questions for me? Yes. Do you have a list of places that, like these resources, that um, is there a place where the list of resources? You can email me. It, it's very specific because remember I said it, it, in regards donation, we like to counsel people to go right to the the the. Uh, the uh, the mission statement of that of the non of the 501c3 organization should match your donation, and so we have a list at the office for sure. If you tell us a harp, we would tell you. Well, this is what we would suggest for that sort of thing. And what? Tell me, give me an example. What do you need? I have an eclectic <laughs> combination of things. Some, 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 some candelabra kind of things that are really. In porcelain? Yes. And what do you want to do with them? I want to find a home for them. I, they're, they're worth something. I'd like to get something. Okay, so um, unless there's a cross swords mark or a beehive with little kind of um, looks like shelves in the beehive, uh, though that's mycin and that, it's, that's Royal Copenhagen or any of the uh, Danish porcelain. Um, those those signs on the uh, if you are they like foliate? There's little flowers and cherubs and this sort of thing. Oh, yes. Yeah. So that they, <laughs> that could be mycin, but it also could be the 19th century copy of mycin, which is called Samson, and that's not worth much. Um, they may fall into that category we were talking about, the the uh, porcelain figurines. Um, what you might want to do is take a picture of it, and my cards are here, and. Um, Take a picture, and there's no charge if you wanted to shoot me a picture. A any of you want to shoot me one or two pictures, there's no charge. And I can tell you, well, it looks like it's 18th century or 19th century. That's the determinant. If it's 18th century porcelain, it may be worth something. If it's 19th century porcelain, it won't be worth. 
May Madness is coming up, and the deadline is May 1st. Uh, and that's the, you know May Madness? Yeah. And they love that kind of stuff. And so um, May Madness is uh, the Music Academy's huge, great big sale. And they seem to do well with placing those sorts of things. Yeah. But we can definitely get you a quick value. I would just like to reinforce that. I've been having one, a wonderful time going through things and finding things for the Music Academy. It's the treasure house that you want to, unless you have those. But it's the Music Academy Treasure House. Yeah. And they are the ones who take the brick and brack, take the, the candelabra, take the, um, in my case, <laughs> lots of things. <laughs> good for you. But, um, but yes, that's very good. And the proceeds of May Madness go directly to fund their scholarships. Yeah, it's, it's a worthy, and, you know, and this is the thing where you say to me, well, Elizabeth, I thought you were telling us to have the mission match the object. In this case, it's such a large sale, May Madness is such a large sale, that they don't report on each individual object that they sell. So there's none of that. Um, remember I was saying that you file one form and then you, the people sell it, they s file another form. That ha so far hasn't happened there because it's just so big. The sale is so, is so big and it's quick. And so um, it's a safe place and it's fun. Uh, let's get a value first because if it's a if it's significant and you have income to offset it, we can take it as a as a donation. So, what? Anybody else? Any other questions? Yes. Just a comment that, that you didn't mention um, the black and white photographs. Color once they're scanned are worthless, but the black and white still have value because of the silver content. And depending on what the silver Doing now, John, did you know that? Ah. Now there's something for you to figure out. Wow! This is something I've never known. San Francisco or LA to find it. But it and I don't know if they would actually pay for the photographs by the pound or if they would pay for them at all, but at least you're getting that silver out of the landfill. That makes a lot of sense when you think about silver nitrate and all that sort of stuff. That, yeah. All right. We will definitely, yes. And another thing related to photographs I've heard is that there are, there are big houses down in Hollywood who actually, for movies, like really old that's right. Yeah, not the snapshots, but maybe so. What are the other right, so the collotypes, the daguerreotypes, the tintypes, all of those, that class of, of photographs. Um, you know, so, so classical photography really doesn't start till well, about 1880, 1890. So the stuff that you're talking about, absolutely. Um, movie houses and some historical societies as well. And people always ask me, how do I know if I have a valuable old photograph? You have a valuable old daguerreotype if there's a dead baby in it. <laughs> I'm serious. Or if there's a celebrity or if the daguerreotype has to do, for example, with the Civil War famous battle. And so it's key to the celebrity because people say, oh, it must have been so rare. Not really. There were plenty of daguerreotypes out there in the Civil War era. So they're not that rare, but there was a genre of um, taking photos of the dead. And uh, there are you know, um, still lives of dead. I mean, really still. <laughs> <laughs> and those are worth quite a bit. And the babies are the, worth the most. And that was a tradition. Yeah. Isn't that strange? Yeah. Any other questions, comments? People were asking me how much my book is. It's $15 if you're interested, and it's also on Amazon. Uh, is it more on Amazon? Is it the same? Is it more on Amazon? Oh, no, I, well, you might have to pay for shipping. Okay, so it could be, I don't know. So it's around the same. But yeah, be happy to sell your book. And then, yeah, I'd love to keep in touch with you guys because I'd love for you to see what comes of um, No Thanks Mom. <laughs> what does that come? I think three, four months. It's <laughs>